It is always a pleasure to welcome David L. Bernstein of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values on this show. Uh, I believe this is his uh, fourth appearance on this program. Um, he recently launched a podcast titled The Contrarian, in which uh, I've heard all of the first three episodes as of this recording. I find them amazing. Um, Thank you. The podcast mostly concerns uh, problems uh, affecting U.S. and Western academia. So that's what mm -hmm. we'll focus on in this hour. Welcome to the show, David. It's great to be with you. I really have enjoyed our past conversations, and I'm looking forward looking forward to this one. All right. Um, I believe uh, our last conversation took place uh, in the wake of October 7th. Mm -hmm. And as of this recording, six months have passed since that date. So uh, how would you reflect on uh, that date um, you know, with half a year has gone by? Yeah. Wow. It's a complicated question because so much is happening at once. Um, it's almost hard to get a handle on. On the one hand, from the Jewish community standpoint, I think there's been profound shifts in attitudes among rank and file American Jews, and particularly among the segment of the American Jewish community that's most actively engaged. I think many of them are, are very confused, concerned about their place in American society. I think that they're very disappointed by how their friends and allies behaved after October 7th and are now sort of in a state of change and reflection on that. I don't know how that will show up in elections, for example, and I'm not suggesting it will, but rather I know that there, there's a lot of rethinking going on. Um, I think the same is the case for American Jewish organizations, although I, I haven't seen as much sort of fundamental change or pivoting yet from the way that they have faced the challenges of the day. But I do think that there are, you know, deep reflection as well. Um, I think American society is in a state of, of flux. Um, the December 5th testimony of those university presidents was a moment, a cultural political moment in America. I mean, I think it must've been among the most watched testimony in U S history, you know, and, uh, and it, it drove home the basic crisis that we have in universities, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, and in general, I think it accelerated some of the trends of polarization and, and ideological fervor that we've been talking about on this podcast from the very beginning. Um, you know, I felt like um, it helped raise awareness. I mean, as bad as these, as it was helped raise awareness of what are some of the challenges that are coming from the ideological left and it and it created a permission structure for pushing back against it and at the same time it exacerbated some of those tendencies as well so the or the most radical groups that are already in our institutions have doubled down in many cases and i think we're seeing more radicalism today than we've ever seen the other thing i want to reflect on is sort of um war and our inability to talk about it anymore. I feel like um, um, we don't have a template for discussing war. Now, I think there is a template. I think just war theory is one such moral template for talking about and thinking about war. Um, what is a just war? Um, what can be done justly, even in the context of a just war? I, so much of the discourse I hear about Israel's behavior in war, and there's a lot of it out there, it just seems to indicate that any civilian casualty is an unacceptable and an act of genocide. And and I, I, I don't think that there's a strong moral framework being brought to bear by people from the White House to, you know, the uh the campus. And um I I'm 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 worried about that. I'm worried that we've lost our understanding that that there's certain wars that must be fought however hard they are. And that doesn't justify everything Israel's done within a war. I think you have to sort of take that apart and unpack that a bit. But um, I worry that we lack sort of a, um, a basic framework for discussing war. <laughs> yes. Um, I should mention that uh, one of the previous guests of this show is uh, the great uh, political theorist, Michael Walzer. Um, he wrote uh, the book on just war theory for the 20th century. Um, I believe... Um, his most recent statements, he has uh, called uh, Israel's action, um, you know, for the most part, just. Um, 
Which brings me to uh, what mm, the news that transpired when um, Israel acknowledges responsibility for the death of, um, I believe, uh, seven or so, uh, eight workers uh, around the area. And mm -hmm. I think whenever Israel um, does something that uh, strikes the international community as wrong, you know, real or alleged, um, Israel has receives a lot of backlash. And I think um, the propaganda arm, I suppose, of the um, um, you know, Palestinian Hamas uh, wing um, becomes more empowered. Now, yes. Why do you believe that uh, so many like well-educated um, Americans and Westerners, I'm thinking about people in like Columbia or Berkeley, believe this line so easily? Yeah, I mean, I think these are people who have come to demonize Israel very often and believe that Israel's intentions are genocidal and not in self-defense. Um, and so... Anything Israel does, anything Israel does, it cannot be justified. Its existence is not. If your existence is, as a country is not justified, then anything you do to defend your existence won't be justified. And you'll always be looked at with tremendous suspicion and even under this specter of accusation. And I think that's what we've we've seen here, that, uh, that you know, there was an immediate assumption that Israel had intentionally murdered these aid workers. And I think that's absurd on the face of it. Now, it may be that there were lower level commanders who acted negligently. And I think the idea found fault there. But what does negligent mean? Does it negligent mean that uh, they acted with incomplete information and didn't have the authority to act? Um, I think that's what the IDF is indicating. Or does that mean that a group of malice uh, commanders uh, or soldiers acted on their own to um to you know shoot down these convoy um or does it mean in their accusation that the israeli government knew everything and at the highest levels they decided to go after this convoy that that latter accusation which is what i was hearing over and over again to me is just absurd on the face of it now you can make a moral argument that the idf is not acting with great enough care in the prosecution of this war and therefore it should be held accountable for the negligence of that. I, I don't think that that's true, though. I mean, I, I again, I'm sure that there were acts that, uh, that one can look at in this war over a period of six months and say, yes, um, so such and such act was not justified and it led to more casualties than it should have. And I think to do that, you actually have to, as my math teacher used to say, uh, show your work. In other words, you have to really go in depth and ask, okay, what happened that day? Who who did what? What was known? What wasn't known? You have to hear from multiple parties before you can make such an assessment. Um, uh, you know, and that takes time. You know, you, there's no doing it on the spot. But I I think that in general, um, there's that wing, that wing that's constantly um, suspicious of Israel, that's demonizing Israel. You know, is going to accuse Israel no matter what it does. <laughs> Um, there's this podcast that I'm listening to right now, obviously, aside from yours, um, called Gate Crashers. It's produced by Tablet, and it's a seven-episode miniseries. Each one of them follows the history of a well-known um, college and university in the U.S. and is um, anti-Jewish um, well uh, policies. Um, I listened to the one at Columbia, and I found out that in the 20s, uh, it set up a separate faculty, a separate college called Setlo that is primarily designed to house uh, Jewish and other supposedly overqualified students um, because uh, the main Columbia campus uh, would like to remain uh, more or less waspy. And I wonder if uh, from, given that history and today with, um, you know, Jewish students and faculties being, you know, um, considered undesirable, so to speak, in Columbia as well as the University of California campuses. Um, um, how would you reflect on all that? Yeah, I mean, these campuses have a long history of sort of quotas for Jews and separating Jews and the like. Um, obviously, you know, I think that changed over time. And in many ways, universities became one of the places where Jews 
fully integrated over time. I mean, they were, you know, Jews didn't do a lot of the same things except maybe celebrate Passover holiday once a year and go to university. I mean, that <laughs> was, um, you know, what, what, you know, more Jews went to university than just about any other thing. I think at one time it was around 400,000 Jewish students per year were, at, were in, you know, a university. So um, universities are a place that Jews tend to look at very fondly, but, you know, have been changing for a long time, if we're honest about it. You know, um, you know, I'm more concerned about the trends that start to take shape at the end of the 1960s rather than the ones in the 1920s. Those are the ones that affect us today. I don't think that old style waspy anti-Semitism is really at play as much. Maybe it is to a degree in that there's still some element of it that's willing to countenance the radicalism from the far left. But um, I think that the real issue now is, is the radicalism from the far left, the postmodernist, the post-colonial ideology that is set in these circles, the complete monopoly of those ideologies over, over certain university departments, the bureaucratization of the university, particularly DEI departments, but not only DEI departments and the like. And I think universities are no longer a particularly receptive place for Jews. On top of that, and really there was a great article in Tablet about this, you have, um, you have uh, students, foreign students who are coming in very often from the Arab world who, um, who sometimes bring their homegrown politics to the university and they join forces with radical progressive students. And I think some of what you see on campus today is what's sometimes turned, termed the red green Alliance, the Alliance between radical Muslim groups and radical progressive groups. Um, these universities get top dollar from these students from the Arab world who are often subsidized by their governments to come. And uh, they also are used to sort of check off a box, um, you know, a diversity box by saying that these are students of color who are, you know, enrolling in the university. And um, I think if you take all these factors together, you have this sort of perfect storm of hostility that uh, many in the American Jewish community now fully recognize, particularly after that, those December 5th hearings. <laughs> the alliance between, um, I guess, uh, progressive Western radicals, uh, those of the woke persuasion, and um, the radical Islamist persuasion, to me, is one of the strangest um, handshakes ever conducted. You know, I, I, I know that in you know, conservatism and in the Republican Party uh, at the moment, um, conservatives uh, would be divided over just like either Ukraine or Trump. But you see these two groups, uh, the Reds and the Greens, as you put it, they share almost nothing in common politically. One seeks a perhaps a radical form of emancipation of the of humanity, and one seeks to uh, impose a uh, philosophy and uh, religious based ethics on the rest of humanity. So, what values or interests do you believe they share or they purport to share? Yeah. So if you're in this sort of the, the radical progressive worldview div tends to divide up people into oppressed oppressors, it, it divides up the global north and the global south. So the global north is oppressing the global south. And if look, look, understood through that very simplistic lens, you see everybody in the global south as uh, being oppressed and everybody in the global north being the oppressor. And Israel's viewed part of an extension of the global north, part of the colonialist west. And uh, Palestinians, Hamas, however you choose to define them, are viewed as the oppressed class in this this situation. And so, um, you know, if, if you start to collapse all causes into a sort of a single oppressed oppressor, uh, you know, cause writ large, as I think we've seen recently, you know, uh, we know where you slot in Hamas or Palestinians, and we know where you, you slot in Israel. And there's very little nuance after that. You know, I think um, you just start to assume that everything that the oppressor does is wrong and everything that the oppressed does is right. Um, and that, you know, the decolonial worldview is that, of course, the people who are oppressed are going to rise up against their oppression. And you saw this in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, while the while there was still blood on the pavement in Israel, there were people already blaming Israel for the massacre against its own citizens. And that really comes directly out of that extremist dichotomy that 
Manichaean worldview that is uh, that you see on the far left. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think that, you know, the radical Islamist groups have any real uh, love for the far left other than that they see them as useful idiots. Um, and and sometimes you see the, the fissures, you know, there was this situation in the area I live in, Montgomery County, Maryland, where there was an imposed gender curriculum in the K through 12 public schools. And, um, you know, this was being imposed by sort of, you know, the radical left. And they were even imposing any opt out provision for parents who didn't want their children to be indoctrinated in the ideology. And what you had were, was a, an absolute groundswell of opposition by Muslims in the area. And you could see groups like the Council of American Islamic Relations, who like to be in lockstep with the far progressive left, all of a sudden be caught in this this battle and 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 have to side with their own Muslim community against the progressive allies. But for the most part, they've managed to insinuate, you know, to create this very simplistic narrative. And so, even if it's true that you know, if you lived, if you were gay and lived in Gaza, you'd be thrown from the rooftops. Um, and if you're gay in Israel, you'll just fit right in because it's got the biggest pride parade, I think, per capita in the world. Um, the you have the you know large swaths of the gay rights movement that's supporting you know Hamas and Gaza. So um, that that's because it's it's sort of all world all these causes are collapsed into a single idea. <laughs> of course, if you ask uh, people who work at uh, Jewish Voices for Peace, they would call that pinkwashing. They would call it pink washing. Exactly. They would be, I, I, I uh, one time had coffee with the woman who wrote the original off uh, article about pink washing. Uh, Lisa Shulman, I think is her name. Um, it was in the, a piece in the New York times about pink washing and they, she can say we're pink washing all she wants. And the truth is that, um, that still, if she were a, a public gay person in Gaza or West bank, she'd have a very different life than if she lived in Israel. That's just a fact, whether you call it pinkwashing or not. <laughs> now, I'd like to uh, zero in on one of the um, administrators who were part of that um, congressional hearing that you mentioned. And of course, that being um, the ex-Harvard president, Claudine Gay. Now, two issues, uh, I guess, strike me as interesting. One, um, she was... Um, uh, the purported or the official reason for her stepping down from the post is that she committed the cardinal sin of academia, which is plagiarism. And um, in the wake of her resignation, it has been discovered that her academic record uh, thus far has been scanned at best. And I wonder um, to what extent is uh, President Gay, I suppose, a diversity hire. Yeah. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I tend not to go there. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm because partly it's because I ultimately want to fit, uh, fix the deep structural issues that <clears throat> produce a president of Harvard who could testify in the way that she did. In other words, if Claudine Gay had not been caught red handed for her plagiarism, um, I still think Harvard would have had a huge problem on its hands. Um, and, um, you know, they, they the huge problem on his hands would be this sort of ideological monopoly that exists in the university. Um, you know, do I think that this drive toward DEI and proportionate representation and, and what's called equity, you know, are going to produce people who are unqualified in certain Slots, absolutely. Do I do I, I don't want I don't need to go there with Claudine Gay in particular because you know I don't know what all the factors were. Maybe she was best friends with the person who did the search. Maybe she had some qualities that they thought would be good for that job. I mean, I just don't want to speculate exactly on that. But I but I do think that I do think that we're 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 that it's a function of a larger ailment that exists in these universities and that we have to. Um, it's time to push back. And I think this presented an opportunity to push back. It, it's changing the conversation. No one had heard the term DEI before December 5th. I mean, people like us did, but many people had not. In fact, the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, my organization, did a poll 
in August 2022, and we polled several, surveyed several wards, um, DEI, anti-racism, critical race theory. And um, uh, critical race theory was very unpopular across the ideological spectrum, but because people knew what it was at that point, this is me interpreting the poll, uh, the findings, um, but people were generally supportive of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And my theory is because they had no idea what they were. But I think that if you took a, the pulse of American society today, that DEI has suffered a huge setback in terms of where what the public understands it to be and uh, what it is. And um, and so I think that we're at a, we're we're moving into a, a different place potentially, and that we have to we have an opportunity to change the conversation about universities and maybe move them move the needle there over mm -hmm. time. Yes, that leads me to my second concern regarding uh, President Gay. Um, I think um, we, as well as people who care about um, free expression and academic standards, sees her as, um, I think, a stand-in for a, I suppose, creeping DEI program that has been instituted either across Harvard or across um, almost all uh, well-known American campuses at this point. And I wonder... Uh, I think this is a pretty obvious question, but um, do you suppose that there's a connection between the prevalence of the ideas associated with DEI and the um, stifling of, um, you know, uh, academic uh, standards and campus values that we all cherish? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, look, DEI is one expression of it. I call it like the bureaucratic representation of the ideology, right? So you take a, an ideology that's been percolating within the humanities and social sciences departments in particular and universities, and it's become deeply entrenched and institutionalized in these departments to the degree that if you're a professor who doesn't go along with it, you may, first, you may, you're going to be, um, you know, bullied by your colleagues and probably not get a job if, uh, uh, these days. So that's number one, I think. Um, but but number two, then you have the bureau this as a bureaucratic representation of it. So now you have a bureaucracy of, in places like University of Michigan with 300 odd staffers, right? Thirty million dollars plus of an annual budget that is uh, that is reinforcing, you know, microaggressions and affinity groups and um, and all the various DEI practices that make it even harder for the university to liberalize. So a, univ a university president or university trustees can talk till they're blue in the face about wanting to liberalize. But if you have a, a, an infrastructure in place, as these universities do, that basically makes it problematic to talk about or critique anti-racism or to have a different opinion on this or insist on DEI statements. And we still have them in many universities for many university departments that are basically political litmus tests for any university job, then you're not going to have a, a campus that respects the free expression of ideas. And, um, and so I think, um, you know, ridding ourselves of DEI bureaucracies is an absolute necessary condition to the kind of restoration that we need to see in universities. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that someone can, um, I suppose, believe in the key tenets of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and still, you know, commit uh, himself or herself fully to, um, say, honest academic work and uh, robust debate, free exchange of ideas, et cetera? Yeah, so it depends on what we mean by DEI. Do I believe yeah. that people who think that there should be something approaching proportional representation um, and inclusive environments and diverse uh, diversity uh, be also classically liberal in a sense? I think it's possible. The problem it depends on what you mean by those. Whether you whether you 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 support those as policy goals or whether you buy into this larger epistemology, right? The which which holds that. <clears throat> Only people with lived experience have standing in these conversations. If you buy into that, right? If you buy into those standpoint claims, that uh, then I think, uh, which usually is packaged with diversity, equity, inclusion. Maybe not always, but frequently. Um, I think it's very that 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 is sort of antithetical to the liberal proposition, because it's saying that only certain people have standing in the conversation, and other people must be shut down. Um, and um, and so so if that's what you believe, and that's what your DEI requires you to believe, then no. If your DEI is just about 
you know, diversity, equity, inclusion in a more limited sense. I, I, I might agree with you at times and disagree with you at times. Like, I, I think it's perfectly acceptable for universities to say, I want to make sure that there are different people at this university, not just along racial lines, but also economic lines and viewpoint diversity lines and so forth, by all means. And, you know, again, I could critique it if you go too far in one direction, but I still think that's an acceptable conversation to have and way of thinking about some of the, the challenges and opportunities. Um, if your equity is about more about equality or just making sure that we give people the opportunities that they have traditionally had, sure, if it's about proportionate representation, I think that's the liberal in some basic way, and I'll probably critique that. But, you know, again, I think there are people with those views that could potentially be at least partially liberal. But if you buy the whole package, absolutely not. <laughs> yes. Um, the idea of standpoint epistemology is something that I, as a university student, um, and this goes across the globe, sees that um, almost everybody who every one of my colleagues believe in. And I agree with you that it is um it is a mistaken way of uh, observing and um, deducing the world around you. But I suppose if I may provide um, something of a devil's advocate defense of it. Sure. Um, I think um the the view of liberalism is that we as individuals uh, have um, I guess unique experiences. We we are our own persons, and such and as such, we have uh, experiences that are different from everyone else. Um, I think um, if um, I and say Alexander Solzhenitsyn were, yeah, um, to publish uh, books relating to experiences living in the um, Soviet Gulag camp. The Solzhenitsyn book would be more believable because he himself has experiences and I have not. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I think um, um, a document on, say, anti-Semitism would uh, uh, be more believable if you're Jewish. And there's this book uh, uh, from the, the 60s, I believe, it's titled Black Like Me. It's about uh, uh, a white reporter who um, disguised himself as a black man to, um, I guess, experience firsthand what it's like to be a black man in the South at that time. And we all kind of laugh at him um, you know, at best and see that as offensive at worst. So so there's, there is a point where personal experience dictates the kind of knowledge that you've gained. So yes. from your perspective, at, at which point does that go like too far? Yeah, look, I perf I agree 100%. First lived experience, as it's often termed, is a is a data point that one has. You know, as a Jew who's experienced anti-Semitism, I would think that you would want to hear me out on it at the very least, because I might have something to say that you've never heard before, right? And and I might see things that you don't see. I'm by the way, you might see things that I don't see as well. It's not like you're being detached from something means you have no perspective. Being detached can be an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on the situation. Um, and um, sometimes when you're embroiled in something intimately, you it, it also skews your perspective. Maybe I'm exaggerating anti-Semitism because I've experienced it in my personal life. Also, what it the problem with it, it is that. Not all Jews have experienced life in the same way. Not all Russians have experienced Russia in the same way. So, you know, um, so I think uh, you have to understand that, you know, there are Jews who've never experienced anti-Semitism um, and they may have a different perspective than I do. Also, again, you have to look at other data points um, that might affect the way you, you think about anti-Semitism. So look, on, on issues that like, um, you know, policing, for example, and um, police violence against people of color, um, you know, I want to listen to young black men who say, yeah, I've been bullied by cops. I just was sitting there playing basketball with my friends and a group of cops came in and they, you know, roughed us up and whatever. Or they, you know, demeaned us, you know, they they did a, you know, they fist us and 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 the like. And I, I think that um, and I and I have to listen to that. And I also want to hear what, you know, Roland Fryer from Harvard has to say about police violence as well. What data points that I might be able to balance that off of against. Both of those are acceptable things to, to factor into one's thinking, and I do factor them into my thinking. The problem with all these ide ideologies is they're sort of heuristics masquerading as axioms. Like there, there's, there are heuristics that, that can help us understand reality to a degree, um, and yet they're turned into these 
grand theories that are supposedly able to explain all of reality. It's like a, a sometimes pretending to be an always. Um, and um, and I think that's the problem. So uh, are you saying that like, you know, uh, lived experience can be a guide to understanding the world? Absolutely. Is it the soul guide? Absolutely not. It, um, can systemic oppression or systemic racism explain reality? Yes. Does it explain all of reality? No. And that's the problem. And so by it's these the grandiosity of these claims that shuts down discourse, that makes it into this ideology that's problematic, not the idea that that there can be systemic factors or not the idea that there can be lived experience. <laughs> now, let's talk about um, academic freedom. Um, I believe uh, you may or may not have come across that um, article by Neil Ferguson in the Free Press it is titled The Treason of the Intellectuals. Yes. He went through um, a rough history of how um, German universities uh, degraded. And there's one story in there that um, struck out to me. Um, it was uh, not in Germany, but in America, in Stanford. In the early 20th century, there was this uh, economist, Edward A. Ross. Um, he held uh, eugenicist views and uh, bigoted views towards uh, Chinese and Japanese. Um, Jane Stanford was um, the president or acting president of the university at that time, um, acted as the administrator and fired him. And, <clears throat> and Ferguson, um, who I think has affiliations with Stanford, of course, um, he saw that as um, a breach of academic freedom. Um, so there's supposed to be, I suppose, a, a wall of separation between the administrators and their, uh, the teaching staff uh, in regards to the teaching staff's job. So to what extent uh, does academic freedom apply when it comes to, uh, say, a professor's views stated, say, outside of the, the classroom, uh, however repugnant the opinion may be? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, and are there some views that are so beyond the pale that they should disqualify a professor from being able to teach? Um, I, I think the the answer to that is probably no. But what I think can be a disqualifying factor is a professor who has a viewpoint that they feel like they must impose on everybody, even if it is a consensus view. In other words, that's bad education. I'll just go back to my years as a college student, the late 1980s. I'm quite a bit older than you are. And um, um, I remember I was in a philosophy class and I had a professor who was teaching us about Descartes and other rationalist philosophers of the day. And, you know, it was a perfectly good class, a great class, actually. We, we talked about various philosophers and their views on the world. And I remember at one point, just in passing, he says, well, I'm a pretty good Marxist. And what struck me is I had no idea what his politics were until that moment. And it didn't matter because he was an excellent teacher. He was an excellent teacher. So I don't know what he thought about Stalin. I mean, maybe he hated Stalin, but maybe he supported Stalin, but it didn't matter because he was teaching us in a dispassionate way that, that, um, and, um, and I, I think rather than sort of make judgments about what's outside the Overton window for a professor to the degree that academic freedom need not apply, I'd rather say, what are universities doing to ensure that the teachers are actually taking a scholarly approach to their own material, that they're teaching multiple perspectives um, and are not indoctrinating their students? I think that's the bigger issue. <laughs> now, secondly, I'd like to... <clears throat> Uh, point to a name that I'm sure you'll be familiar with, uh, Norman Finkelstein. I actually had in, him on this uh, show before. Um, mm -hmm. So I believe it was in uh, 2007 that um, you know Finkelstein's name became like a, a nationwide knowledge, where he was uh, laid off from his um, his uh, college, uh, DePaul, um, and there was this lengthy battle between uh, him and Alan Dershowitz, and to this day, I think Finkelstein still uh, attests that it was is because of his uh, criticism of the state of Israel that got him fired. And I believe more recently, um, Cornel West um, says that the reason why he left Harvard for, I suppose, Union Theological Seminary, because he was critical of Israel. And there was this time when um, BDS was a thing and 
everyone was calling for academic boycott of uh, Israeli scholars and Israeli goods and et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder to what extent um, should, let's say, anti-Israel academics coexist with uh, ones that are more pro-Israel? Yeah, look, I there are plenty of anti-Israel academics. Maybe the majority <laughs> of them are are, are um, anti-Israel, and I'm certainly not there to get rid of anti-Israel academics. I, I think a lot of it has to do with what they're are they teaching the material fairly, or are they a bunch of political activists? And um, that's the distinction I make. You know, I don't mind having an anti-Zionist professor for one of my kids. Are they? teaching about Zionism too. And are they, you know, they can have their private views and they can have their public views as long as they're teaching the material fairly. But if they're just political activists masquerading as academics, then to me, that's the problem. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I, I'm not, you know, I've never been in a class for Cornell, Cornell West. I strongly disagree with his, with his views on, on Israel, but that wouldn't disqualify him. You know, I do get concerned that you have these departments that are so heavily ideological that there, that there are very few people who support Israel on teaching about this material, even in places where they tried to uh, establish Israel studies departments in several universities. Sometimes they were taken over by really radical post-Zionist or anti-Zionist professors. So um, I, I'm not there to disqualify any single professor. Um, you know, Finkelstein, by the way, wrote a book on the, I think it was called The Holocaust Industry. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that probably got him in deeper doo-doo than, <laughs> um, than anything he said about Israel. Um, but, you know, again, I'd have to look at it more closely. I remember those battles. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, but, you know, and I do think universities have a responsibility to try to cultivate viewpoint diversity among their faculty. I mean, if you just look at the poll, the survey data now, it's, it's disgraceful. Like if you, you know, if you have, you know, if it's uh 10 to one or more, I mean, Harvard, I think there were 3% conservative professors and those are probably all in, you know, the hard sciences, you know, um, and um, you know, maybe a few in the economics department, that's a disgraceful. It means like people are being taught a single view of the world. So, um, so, uh, you know, is that a violation of academic freedom when we seek out diversity? Are we talking about a kind of viewpoint affirmative action? I think the answer is probably yes. I mean, people don't like to term it viewpoint affirmative action, but I think a university that has done everything it can to stack the deck in a certain way that's against free thought should proactively try to bring in professors. Does that mean that I that I'm trying to get a, uh, uh, you know, professors fired who don't share my politics or view of the world? No. But that doesn't mean that they should become the be the, the have a monopoly over it either. <clears throat> now, one thing that um, concerns me too is that there is this there's uh, a tyranny of Edward Said within virtually all Middle East departments these days. Um, um, you know, ever since he wrote Orientalism and his other works, um, he has his influence in that particular field of study has been tremendous and there has not been like uh, enough credible academics uh, who stand opposed to him. I, I suppose people like Eli Kaduri or Bernard Lewis, they've all died yeah. out, unfortunately. I mean, we could still seek out their work, but presently there are no professors alive speaking that can mm -hmm. you know, research and study and teach the Middle East in a way that is uh, outside of that Saidian framework. Yes. Yeah, I think that's true. What I think Saeed did in what you're seeing in sort of the ideological takeover of universities more broadly is to is to absolutely obliter obliterate the possibility of any cultural critique. It's basically saying you Westerners have no authority to critique the societies and cultures of, you know, the so-called third world or whatever. And, and so I may believe that there are certain cultural practices in certain parts of the world that lead to their the disparities that we're seeing that, yes, okay, colonialism may be one factor in certain areas. Colonialism, by the way, may have also helped certain societies propel ahead too, depending on the society. Um, but but that 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 culture was um is is a is a is an obvious factor in understanding why certain societies are more modernized than other societies. Was it Jared Diamond? And, you know, I always get the title wrong, Guns 
German Steel, yes. you know, who yes. wrote about the the development of societies through various factors, through geographic factors, through, uh, you know, some societies developed farming at earlier times than others, based on based on the sort of kind of animals that could be domesticated in those in those areas, and other factors that account for why certain societies developed quicker. And I think those those explanations go a long way of ex in explaining why um, some societies uh, are further along than others. Now, I'm, I understand that the people say further along, that's ethnocentric. Well, a lot of societies want to be further along. A lot of the people in those societies say, why don't we have two car garages and so forth? And um, and why is it that, you know, in the United States, their, their standard of living is 20 times our standard of living? So, so, you know, it's not, so, you know, one has to come up with explanations for that. And, um, and I, you know, I, a lot of the explanations you hear that you take off the shelf are based on sort of this, uh, you know, orientalist critique, which says that that we're doing violence upon societies in which we try to describe those those cultural norms. Um, you, you know, Jared Diamond, whose book, you know, was all the rage when it came out, was eventually sort of sidelined and called a racist by various anthropologists and, and the like. But it's obviously a powerful explanation. I mean, how could culture not account for difference. Cultures are different, right? People live by different sets of norms by their very nature. If, if all cultures were the same and had the same effect on our ability to adapt to a certain kind of economy, then there would be no such thing as culture. We'd all be the same, but we're not all the same. And um, and so this idea that somehow we have to suppress culture because, because and it is true that cultural critiques can lapse into a kind of racism um, or if you want to use Saeed's words, Orientalism, a kind of uh, th that's that's demeaning of other societies that that can be true. But it doesn't mean that those societies, certain societies aren't being held back by certain cultural norms. It just that's ridiculous. And um, and so I think we've allowed the ridiculous to reign supreme. And we need to find a way of talking about cultural differences again, if we're going to be if we're going to be able to understand, you know, why certain countries, civilizations, people, groups do better than others? <laughs> now, um, two questions can come from, uh, I guess, uh, colonization and the legacy of colonialism. Uh, one, uh, the more obvious one, I suppose. Uh, why, how come, how has Israel joined the ranks of uh, the British and the French and the Germans as colonizers? Right. Yeah. Well, that's ridiculous, of course. Um, <laughs> it, it is. Um, and um, there, there, I think one, I, I'm blanking on his name, but one of the people who originally started to define Israel as a paradigmatic colonialist empire actually wrote a book which explained why Israel was different on all these various ways from other colonial powers, but still held Israel up as a colonial power. But it was different categorically um, in its in its history. It was it didn't seek to to conquer anybody it sought to have a homeland of its own and uh, there's a complex history of how it achieved that but that doesn't make it a, a colonizer of course not um in fact in many ways israel was at odds with the uh with the reigning colonial power at that time which was great britain in the region um and uh there were you know there were constant clashes uh, between it it was it was in some ways the insurgent against colonialism during that time so it's of course ridiculous, but that's exactly what this ideology has produced. And it's sort of the convergence of this anti-Zionism that started in the Soviet Union in the 1960s and the post-colonial ideology that took shape in the early 1970s. And you had those two forces come together and and start to see Israel as the, you know, the the standard bearer of colonialism. And um, and that's really remained with us today. I mean, that's still the discourse on the far left. And that's why people can sort of view anything that Israel does is wrong, no matter what. <laughs> I think um, for anyone who says that Israel is a colonizing power, I think the best way to, um, I guess, rebut them is to show show them the map of the world and then dare them to point to where Israel is. Because I think... Uh, I think you have to like squint to to really point right. out that country. Like so, yeah. Even if even if you don't look at the whole world, you just look at the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You have to squint yeah. Yeah. to see that little sliver of land, <laughs> you know, sandwiched between various l larger countries mm -hmm. in the region. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, so in your view, how what is the central error of uh, post-colonial or decolonization theory? Yeah, well, I think post-colonial theory is about, you know, why certain countries continue to languish and that they continue to be victims of the exploitation of these bigger powers, right? Um, and um, and so, um, you know, the, the and and you know, there's, for example, dependency theory, right? That that these countries, that certain countries are, remain dependent um, on these countries who keep them who keep them in their place. And that explains why there's lagging development in places like Latin America, is that they're dependent on the United States, they're dependent on multinational corporations. So that's that's sort of the uh, sort of the extension of post-colonial theory. Decolonialism, at least in the US, tends to mean that we have these sort of remnants of, of colonialist culture, imperialist culture in our society that continue to hold down um, marginalized people. And so we're, when you decolonize something, you're actually you're actually extracting the remnants of this uh, this white supremacy ideology that's that's coded in every institution. So if you're decolonizing social work, you're 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 no longer treating the um, the client as somebody who needs to adapt to the system you're now telling the client to recognize and resist systems of oppression that continue to keep him down the reason why the client is facing these tough issues is because they're oppressed not because they're not because they've uh, you know um you know that they're addicted to some illegal substance or because you know um they've been abandoned by their father or whatever. No, they're, they're, because they're an oppressed group. And so forth, if they recognize the oppression, they can help throw the sh off the shackles of the oppression. So decolonialism seeks to do that throughout society. And, um, and uh, you know, obviously it's deeply connected to post-colonial theory, but it it is sort of the domestic version of it. <laughs> of course. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a proactive program too. <laughs> it's not just a theory of why we have... <laughs> The situation we're in, decolonialism is a is a political agenda, in a way. Now we're going to decolonize all these fields and decolonize our universities and decolonize our institutions. Um, it, it's a liberatory framework. Uh, now I'm from Vietnam, and Vietnam was a French colony, and <clears throat> you know I think of, instinctively I found any I find any ideas relating to uh, decolonization or post colonial theory kind of ridiculous because uh, for um, us like third world people, it it reeks of this uh, weird, like like the kind the same kind of white savior mentality that led colonizers to come and, you know, either on a civilized uh, and exploitative mission to begin with, they, mm. they think that they are better than us. And because of that, uh, um, they think that they can deny the gifts of, and there were gifts of uh, of westernization upon you know, non-western lands, um, i.e., anything to do with modernization. So, in some ways, decolonization is mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> is an attempt, if successful, to to deny the gift of modernity to um, non-western countries. And mm. I always look. Yeah, at that's very well put. Yeah, my yeah. wife's from Hong Kong, and also, you know, uh, who you know. Grew up in basically a, a a British colony for most of her life, and um, and also finds it just an absurd, um, you know, an absurd discourse because <laughs> you know, I, look, I mean, Hong Kong, um, for all the brutality of colonialism, and it was brutal in Hong Kong as well, um, you know, ended up um, much further along than than mainland China did because it was a former colony, and we have to be honest about these things and understand, you know, sort of the mixed legacy of colonialism um, and be able to talk about it in complex ways. Um, I think we're denied that ability to do that. And of course, it leads to sort of a white savior complex in reverse now, now as you're saying, you know, um, and uh, these are people who basically think that Western ideas and values are inherently corrupt and wrong. And, and in a way, if they were successful, it would be a tremendous setback for any society that that followed their lead. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're doing nobody any favors by 
seeking to, um, you know, decolonize those societies of Western influences to the contrary. Mm -hmm. I look at, of course, historically in the present, how countries like some in the Middle East and some in Africa, where the the leaders who and their government were trying to push aggressively against anything uh, you know, reeking of a Western influence in their country. And all I see is tyranny. Yeah. You know, look, I mean, some of these countries, they want to have their cake and eat it too. So they want, on the one hand, to, um, you know, to welcome Western investment and lifestyles. The people generally want that in a way, but they also want to um, use those Western influences as scapegoat when when things aren't going their way, when when their society uh, are are experiencing, you know, unrest. So, um, you know, I, it is it is it is complicated, the the role of 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 the West in sort of these the collective imagination of these societies. Um, they hate it and love it at the same time in seemingly paradoxical ways. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that accounts for the sort of rampant resentment, but at the same time, idealization. <laughs> um, to what extent, uh, from your experience, um, observing and perhaps visiting Israel has, has that country maintained like its, um, its Jewish character while also, um, I guess, import certain aspects of the West in its, uh, borders? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Look, Israel is a amalgamation of different cultural influences. I mean, my mom is from Baghdad, Iraq, and you have you have Middle Eastern influences. I mean, part of Israel is also has a sort of an Arabic culture uh, dimension, right? Um, and you have the you know Enlightenment values brought by Ashkenazic Jews that are that come to play there, and then you have the experience of Russian Jews, which is ex which is quite distinct from these sort of emancipated European Jews. These are people who came out of a totalitarian state and understand what totalitarianism is, and they tend to be very suspicious of easy solutions and utopian ideals um, and tend to vote on the political right as well. Um, and, um, I, you know, and then, you know, and then there's traditional Jewish influences and in, and and the like, and even that varies depending on what culture you come from. I think it's 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 what Judaism ought to be in a way. It's like it's it's um, you know it's a traditionalist framework trying to make sense of um, of modernity. And and uh, Israel is a country that has both influences. In some ways, if you go to Jerusalem, you're seeing traditional Judaism and the um, the original you know that that narrative. That Zionism was uh, supposed to yield a Jewish state, and then you go to Tel Aviv and you see the sort of secular Israel, <laughs> right? The norm, the quest for normalcy. One Jerusalem is a representative of the quest for chosenness and covenant. Maybe covenant is the right word, and Tel Aviv is a representative of the quest for normalcy. And both of those ideals lived within the Zionist narrative, right? They were contested in a state of tension, dialectical tension within the Zionist narrative, and they continue to be in uh, dialectical tension today. Um, and um, I think it's fun, you know. I mean, if you're a secular Israeli going to Jerusalem and feeling that overwhelming sense of covenant and what it requires us and the religiosity can be very disconcerting. And for um, a Jew who's Orthodox, who's going into Tel Aviv and seeing the secular lifestyle can feel like an abandonment in a way. But I, I like it. I like being able to tr transition from those two worlds and more and more when you're in the country like that. So they live in uneasy partnership and opposition with each other. <laughs> so uh, two final queries. Uh, one, um, to what extent do you find this book, The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom, still relevant? Yeah, I think he was sort of prophetic, wasn't he, in some ways? Um, you know, I I mean, it's been a long time since I read the book, um, but I think, has have I frozen? Yes, uh, I think you are. So. Do you, do you, are you doing this by video or is it only by audio? So, Alan Bloom, uh, yeah. So, you know, I thought I think Alan Bloom, who I thought could be a bit of an old fogey, like I, one of the things he didn't like um, 
he didn't like Harry Potter, for example, which I thought was, <laughs> you know, he thought was, you know, inferior literature. But other than that, you know, I think Alan Bloom was onto something. He understood that there was the closing of American mind. And what we started to see in the late eighties and the early 1990s was the, were the same intellectual trends we're seeing now that we're starting to find their way in, in our discourse. And there were other people who started to write about it. My friend, Jonathan Rausch, um, wrote about it. Um, I think it was a 1994 book, maybe. And uh, the kindly um, inquisitors, right? Yeah. Kindly inquisitors. Um, there were, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't go back as far as either of them, but, um, even in, you know, I, I, I wrote my first articles and memos about it more than 20 years ago. So there were, there are people who have been watching this for a long time. These intellectual trends, um, uh, take shape and, um, we should have listened to them more. We should have understood that they, um were um so excuse me uh that they that they had um an important view to share and that i think w many people particularly liberals were in denial of that they were in denial of that the discourse was shifting they wanted to believe that that you know that they were still in sort of a superior moral condition and um and couldn't imagine that their own political camp could would would be would be a source of a liberalism. <laughs> so finally, how optimistic are you about the uh, University of Texas, or sorry, University of Austin, the newly formed uh, college in Texas? Yeah, I mean, I think the the experiment in University of Austin is is very important one, and I wish it the success, and I think it will succeed. But it's hard to scale, right? Because it's such an expensive proposition, and it takes so long to get it uh, off the ground, and it has a certain celebrity quality, having you know very key names associated with it that a future universities won't get. But I think the model that were that is even more hopeful are these sort of centers for civic learning and thought that are existing that are emerging within existing universities now some people have pointed out like my friend greg lukianoff at fire that these um that these civic institutions within universities are susceptible to ideological takeover by the larger university environment but i think that that could happen but not probably won't happen in many instances and i think that's a more scalable proposition than creating a bunch of University of Austin's all over the United States. I think it's easier for the University of North Carolina or for F University of Florida or Ohio State University to develop these alternative institutions that are immune from some of the radical ideological currents and restore sort of, uh, you know, traditional Western education. Um, I, and I, and in so doing, by the way, attract really top faculty talent and really top student talent. And over time, maybe even eclipse the more radical grievance studies programs at universities. I think that that's a hopeful development. And um, and I'm going to cheer on both the independence of the University of Austin as well as these interdependent uh, civic thought centers. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, Tocqueville as uh, answer of yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to end Thank on. You. Thank you very much again, David L. Bernstein, for All joining right. the show. It's great to be with you.